that you um, you use the chat feature in the center at the bottom. It's the little talk bubble. Um, I'm curating the chat and I'll be watching for questions that you may have for Joey and I'll be posing them to him. Because the presentation goes along. So um, feel free to, to type in your question and know that I will make sure that it gets asked. And with all that said, um, Gary, I'll let you do the introductions. Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Gary Wine. I'm the executive director for the Highlands Cashers Land Trust, and I want to welcome you to the uh, 12th in a series, 12th year in a series of, 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 of lectures. Um, both Ann and I and our respective organizations firmly believe that an educated constituency makes educated decisions, and that's the reason we bring this series to you. Um, the, the Land Trust has been around a while. We, we originate in 1883. Um, but we really get active in 1909. Um, we currently protect over 3,400 acres in 105 places in, in and around uh, Southern Macon and Jackson County. And they include places like McKinney Meadow, the top of Laurel Knob, um, Rock Mountain, Jimmy Top, and The Big View. So uh, if you want to learn more about us, check out our website. So I get the privilege of introducing Joey Kyle and actually Joey um, is a is a farm manager at, at Many Hands Peace Farm located at the Mountain Retreat Center, which is one of our conservation easements. Um, turns out at the top of the the mountain retreat center is a 400 year old dwarf white oak forest. It's actually absolutely incredible. They're about 25 feet tall and about 14 inches in diameter. They're really neat. But Joey works at the Mountain Retreat and Learning Center, which is located over in Highlands um, on Little Scaly Mountain. Uh, he and the farm crew manage a flock of over 100 poultry, four beehives, a forest, a food forest, and a diverse veggie farm. He leads foraging tours, mushroom identification walks, forest to table, dinners throughout the summer. Um, you can also find him on Wednesdays and Saturdays vending wild mushrooms and other farm goodies at the Highlands and Cashers Farm Market. Joey. Take it away, it's your program. Thanks, Joey. Take yourself off mute though. Unmute. All right, how about now? All groovy? Um, excellent, okay. So I'm gonna to try to share screens. Let's see if this works. Da, da, da. Okay, how's that going for everybody? Can I get a thumbs up from people that have video on? Yeah. Oh yeah, excellent. Okay, well, thank you very much, Gary. Yeah, and it is a pleasure to work somewhere that is protected by the Highlands Cashers Land Trust. Um, yeah, anything else? Let's see. Yeah, I've been here for about four years and it's been my pleasure to really hit the ground running with edible mushrooms. Um, I am a licensed by the health department of the tri-state area to sell wild mushrooms and we'll go into a little bit of that today. Um, and I think today's presentation is, is quite jam-packed to the point where I'm, it will hopefully not overwhelm you too much. Um, I'm trying to, I feel like it's almost two presentations in one, which is uh, how can mushrooms save the world and other applications, and then the edible fungi on this plateau that we call home. So we'll see. Um, and definitely yeah, hit me with your questions. I love taking questions from the public, especially because I feel that fungi in particular are quite underrepresented in the, the public eye, especially educationally. Um, so here we go, without further ado. So the kind of scope of what we're gonna try to tackle today is kind of overview of what does the kingdom fungus look like? Um, and then some of the, the obvious applications of eating them, um, the medicinal applications, um, something called mycoremediation or using mushrooms to kind of remedy uh, contaminants in our environment. And then some other applications that you may have not considered for, for fungi. Um, and then beyond that, we're going to go into kind of foraging on the plateau. So using, um, yeah, finding wild mushrooms and some of the ethics that go along with that. Um, we're going to have to talk about the bad ones, the, the poisonous and lethal mushrooms that grow in our forests. Um, and then we'll go over some of the principal wild mushrooms um, that are common to our area, some of which you may not be as familiar with. Um, and then kind of go with some more examples of other wild fungi that you've probably seen about um, but may not know by name. Um, and then we'll end with questions and obviously you can interject and Anne will let me know what you guys are feeling. So without further ado, here we go. We'll start with the kingdom fungus. So it's split up into a couple groups. 
One which is now technically in the protist uh, kingdom is slime molds, which have a surprisingly good amount of problem solving skills that scientists are studying. Um, we've got your bread mold, so your green stuff on your bread is in the kingdom fungus, releasing spores similarly to other mushrooms. You've got mushroom molds that grow on mushrooms and other soil borne fungi. Um, you've got your, your other, this is, they call these the imperfect fungi. So you've got your camembert cheese, you've got your yeast infections, your athlete's foot, um, and other, including penicillin producing fungi um, in this group. Uh, you've got your lichens, like the lichenized fungus known as rock tripe, which you may have seen on rock faces in these woods. Um, some might call it agriculture as it's a fungus working alongside a cyanobacteria or algae. You've got your cup fungi, uh, including the morels, the much coveted morels, which are one of the most expensive mushrooms in the world. You've got your classic basidiomycetes, which include most of the traditional mushroom shapes um, that, that you know to eat and find in supermarkets. So mycology is the study of fungi, and when one studies fungi, that you are a mycologist. Uh, I am an amateur mycologist. I'm not graduate trained, but I've hit the ground running, and I am at least trusted by the health department to sell wild mushrooms. Um, and so what constitutes a fungus? Well, one of the biggest components is they have chitin in their cell walls. So cell walls of, of animal cells are different and plant cells are different, but in, in, in the case of fungi, chitin is the main component, which makes them hard to digest. Chitin is the same thing found in ants' exoskeleton. Um, and in this case, um, we don't really have the enzymes in order to digest them raw, which is why I always advocate for cooking mushrooms. So heat and, and oil can help break down uh, those cell walls. They're eukaryotes, so they have nuclei in their cell. And similar to humans, uh, we in, they inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide, which is why some people put them in greenhouse settings with plants because they complement each other very well. They're heterotrophs, meaning they get their food outside of themselves. They're not um, getting anything from the sun um, and they have to like mine their environment to derive nutrition. Um, and growth is their main means of mobility. They use spores to, to go to far lands, but then growing is how, is how they move about. Um, and they've been on land for a long time and they comprise several million species. So it's a big kingdom and an old kingdom. Um, and we're, they're not that far off from animals. So, I mean, they're one of our closer evolutionary relatives um, in the kingdom perspective. And then what does it look like in their life cycle? So um, if, if we start with like the traditional mushroom shape, like right here is an Amanita muscaria mushroom. Um, this is the apple on the tree, even though apple is a plant, I'll use it as a metaphor of this is sticking above the ground and it's only in existence really to release spores, right? So the seeds of the fungi are the spores and they're looking for whatever they enjoy eating. Um, in the case of a wood eating mushroom, like the hemlock reishi, it's looking for dead hemlock trees and it finds a dead hemlock and will start to germinate, kind of like a seed would germinate. Um, and then two of those spores fuse together to start to make a mycelial mat. Now, I will point out that this spores and the germinating is the point of sexual reproduction. So you've got two spores that are different mating types. And then fungi, there's not, just, there's not just male, female. You've got some species which have 20, 30, some with over 100 mating types, um, which can fuse together and they're looking for diversity. So after they germinate in their appropriate environment, they're going to make a like, kind of mycelial network. So if you've ever like picked up a piece of of rotten wood and you see this white filaments that's just a mycelial network which combines kind of the entire forest ecosystem um, and then when they start to form mushrooms they form primordia so this kind of this over here is a, a bag of oyster mushrooms which i had grown in my closet um, and it's eating sawdust and then it forms these pins or primordia um, and it's, it's making thousands here only of which maybe 20 will actually make an oyster mushroom so it'll choose the, the best fitted ones that have the best exposure to oxygen um, to make mushrooms. Um, and then you're going full circle back and forth. Um, and, then, and then interestingly, I'll point out that you can clone mushrooms by taking chunks of the mycelium. So if I took a chunk of this sawdust mycelium uh, and put it on more sawdust, it would make an exact clone, a genetic copy of whatever the oyster was to begin with. And then just kind of showing you here that puffballs are, are kind of following a different means. This is a gilled mushroom making spores, but other mushrooms like the puffball makes a sphere of, of spores that require mechanical input from rain to disperse them, um, just like this. So that's the general fungus life cycle. Um, and they can take many shapes and sizes, 
Um, and we'll see definite examples of that. Uh, I'll draw your attention to Amanita being one of the more dangerous genuses. It's home to the more lethal mushrooms in the world. The death cap is the most lethal mushroom and causes most mushroom fatalities is an Amanita. And we have a local one that we'll talk about called Destroying Angel. That's another Amanita. And I'll draw attention to the fact that it emerges from this little egg sac in the ground. Then you've got Agaricus, which is like your button mushrooms, your Cremini, your Portobello. Caprinus, also known as Shaggy Mane, is a one of famous one there. Um, boletes are kind of stalked mushrooms with pores. So all these are gilled mushrooms, but this one has spongy pores on the bottom. You've got bracket fungi or shelf mushrooms, which are typically wood loving, um, going right off the sides of dead trees or living trees um, and have pores on the bottom. Earth star, you may look at this and see is a flower and an acorn hybrid, but it's actually a fungus. And then coral can take many, take many shapes and sizes. Um, all different ways that mushrooms can, can live in this world. So one of the main things that fungi are known for is breaking down wood, like are breaking down rotten or dead wood. Um, and these are some principal ones that you may be familiar with. You've got our local hemlock reishi seeking out dead hemlock trees. It's not hurting the trees, it's only breaking them down when they're dead. Um, a very medicinal mushroom we'll talk about. Shiitake means oak mushroom in Japanese. So the shiitake um, loves oak. It's from Asia, but people cultivate it in their backyards and has actually gone wild in places like Asheville. Um, and then you've got turkey tail here, um, kind of resembles a turkey's tail, also found on wood. And oftentimes you'll find multiple fungi on the same log. Um, and in some cases, for example, if, when we cultivate shiitake on oak logs, after the shiitake has done its thing and the, and the log is on the way to soil, the turkey tail might move in. So there are primary and secondary decomposers in the fungi kingdom. Um, yes, and they all have different things to offer. And basically these are creating soil. So a common uh, trajectory is from a fresh oak log to be broken down by this shiitake. And then the turkey tail moves in. And then you can start to crumble it. It's almost on the way to soil. It's kind of like peat moss. And the mycelium of these mushrooms attracts earthworms, which break it down even more. And what you're left with is, is basically soil, which is for the benefit of all surrounding plants. So it's pretty cool trajectory for those wood, wood decomposers. Apart from that, you've, apart from the wood decomposers, like the chicken of the woods pictured here, you've got another type of fungi, which are the kind of soil-borne or mycorrhizal fungi. One of the most famous is the chanterelle, which we'll talk about later, um, which is coming straight out of the ground. And so what they what what they're what there's going on there is they've got a relationship with mature trees. In the case of chanterelles, it's principally hardwoods like oak, um, and that relationship can take a long time to develop. So I say relationship. So there's something there's an interchange going on, and what's taken place evolutionarily is mushrooms like the chanterelle. What they have to offer is that mycelial network underground, which has a lot greater surface area than a plant's root system. And so this highway system that is so, so sophisticated um, is, is a better, more efficient, quicker way to move nutrients. And the trees are willing to trade carbohydrates and other nutrients in order to gain access to that, to that network. And so it's a chemical relationship, exchanging nutrients in exchange for the highway system. Pretty amazing that this takes place without written language. They don't need any contracts or anything. Um, and so that's a so soil-borne fungi, many of which don't make mushrooms themselves they may exist entirely underground and we're discovering species every day of new soil-borne fungi and these soil-borne fungi also are the reason why like plants do well in, in any garden setting even even though we try to make very like sterile agricultural systems oftentimes um, fungally dominated soils will create stronger healthy plants and the last category would be parasitic so in this case we've got a genus of mushrooms in the world called cordyceps um, which infect insects and arachnids um, and basically mummify them. So they seek out the host, kill it, um, and then burst forth with mushrooms. And I'll show you some local examples of those. Um, and, and they, yeah, directly kill, kill it. Um, and there's other examples of parasitism with like the honey mushroom. Um, it, it directly hurts oak trees. And obviously we can, we can talk about fungal pathogens, including like the chestnut blight. Um, fungi are not here exclusively for the benefit of all. They, there is definitely some dominance going on um, and some yeah, harboring of disease and, and other bad stuff. Um, but in this case, it's actually a medicinal mushroom. So it's not, all, it's not all bad. There's a diamond in the rough. So food, food is one of the direct ways that you can commune with the mushroom. Um, obviously eating it, why are we eating them? Um, they're mainly known as being sources of protein, a little bit of carbohydrates, 
a lot of vitamins, uh, one of which is vitamin D. Um, one of the only vegan vitamin D sources, uh, shiitake being very famous for that. If you like sun dry a shiitake, its vitamin D levels go way up, just like our skin um, needs sun exposure for vitamin D production. Um, but we really, uh, hu as humans, have domesticated um, only a handful of species, and we only commercially grow about 10. The main three, which you may know, are like button mushrooms, so your portobello cremini um, and other buttons. Um, and the shiitake and the oyster are the main mushrooms in the world that are consumed by humans. So it's a pretty bland palette. And in my opinion, button mushrooms are so boring compared to most of the other mushrooms we'll talk about today. Um, but we've really only cracked the code on these. And commercial, they're commercially viable because we got it down to a science. They eat sawdust with wheat bran and a little bit of gypsum, and then you get the best load. Whereas other, other mushrooms, we haven't cracked that code yet. And I draw your attention to this little county in Pennsylvania, which produces 50% of the United States mushrooms. Um, so it's not really because there's anything going on there locally, other than historically some Quakers decided to grow some mushrooms under their greenhouse beds. And now it's one of the, the biggest mushroom um, empires in the world. Many businesses are, and growers are concentrated in that area of Pennsylvania. Uh, and other mushrooms um, like the chanterelles, the morels and truffles are primarily harvested out of the wild. And we can't really replicate those tastes with cultivated mushrooms. Like you can't really compare a truffle to anything that we can grow in a, in a concentrated commercial setting. But there's a caveat there, which is we can kind of grow morels. We can kind of grow truffles. We haven't figured out chanterelles at all because they need 20 year relationship with trees. But in the case of morels, we've been able to replicate that a little bit in a laboratory setting, but still not to where it's chemically viable. And then truffles, you can today buy a $50 truffle tr uh, pecan tree that has a good chance in 10 years of yielding some truffles. So there's some, some kind of experimental cultivation going on with some of these other species that are typically seen as only in the wild. But I will say that most of those are inferior in taste and quality to the wild uh, versions of those. Um, the European truffles, there's nothing really that compares with that. Um, and then just this kind of demonstrate, this is out of Paul Stamets growing, um, growing, what's it called? Growing gourmet medicinal mushrooms, which is one of the resources that I've put, given to Anne. Um, just kind of demonstrating how you can grow mushrooms. So typically starting with spores, growing it on a Petri dish, uh, sterilizing some grain, and then you can go into logs like shiitake logs. You can grow them in trays, bags, bury it. Humans have experimented with many ways. Uh, begs the question of, have we domesticated them or have they domesticated us? The classic question. And more than just eating mushrooms, fungi are responsible for a lot of our other enjoyed foods and, and spirits, uh, be, it, be it alcohol, be it tempeh, be it breads um, and, and various fancy cheeses. So thank you, thank you fungi for more than just your, your fruiting bodies. <laughs> And the medicinal applications. So more than just food, food can be thy medicine, but we also sometimes need antibiotics. And in the case of one moldy cantaloupe, this is an orange, but a moldy cantaloupe that was found in the trash in Peoria, Illinois, was the precursor to most penicillin uh, that was used in World War II. And it's the case that, I mean, you've maybe heard the Alexander Fleming story where he left a window open in a Petri dish, got invaded by a mold, and the mold showed some ability to inhibit the growth of gram-positive bacteria. And they were able to synthesize penicillin, but in tiny quantities. And it wasn't until they found this moldy cantaloupe in a trash can and then blasted it with radiation to make it mutate to where they were able to make it a thousand times more productive and, and industrially viable. Um, so pretty cool, inspiring story. And then on the right here, we're looking at the mycelium of an elm oyster mushroom that was infected with, with strep throat. So this was the strep throat of one person in particular, and the mushroom responds with a liquid exudate, and this amber-colored liquid has experimentally shown to basically be a homemade antibiotic that's personalized to whoever the strep is from. Um, this is not in clinical trials yet, but it's still like being worked on. Um, the idea of making homemade antibiotics that are made for me, not for anyone else, but for me, and maybe decreases the, the chances of a superbug versus like a, just a broad spectrum antibiotic. And then just some of the more famous medicinal mushrooms, um, many of which grow around here. So we've got um, on the left here, uh, cordyceps. So cordyceps, um, this is from Tibet. Um, so a lot of uh, poor peasant farmers in Tibet 
in their free time um, will scour the landscape above 11,000 feet looking for little caterpillars infected by the cordyceps fungus um, and then sell them for a good amount of money. And this mushroom accounts for 10% of Tibet's GDP and 40% of the cash in rural Tibetan communities. Um, and why is it prized is because on a, on a cellular level, it mimics ATP, which gives us energy for every cellular function, be it making proteins and whatnot. So there's, there's an energy boosting effect. It, it can fool our cells. Um, and we've been able to cultivate it outside of just the insects. We can cultivate it on rice and a mixture of nutrients. So uh, one of the more famous um, medicinal mushrooms that grow in these woods, and I'll show you some wild examples, um, turkey tail, somewhat resembling a turkey's tail. Um, this was taken locally and just to demonstrate that it's, it's kind of like gray, blue on top, there's different colors, and then the bottom it has small white pores. Because um, there are other mushrooms that kind of resemble this from the top, but none of them have small white pores on the bottom. This mushroom um, is famous for, I mean, people toss around the word anti-cancer. I'm not going to make any big claims or anything. Uh, one of the links I give is mushroomreferences.com. Um, and one big study that's, that's cited there shows people who undergo chemo, um, who are then administered turkey tail as a treatment, have their immune systems rebound much more quickly. Their immune system, yeah, their function goes back to normal much more quicker than those who don't receive the treatment. Um, and it just shows if in vitro and in, in petri dishes, it has anti-tumor activity. So that's turkey tail and then reishi, our local reishi. Um, reishi has a long history in traditional Chinese medicine um, going back at least 4,000 years and then they've been cultivating it more recently um, as being an adaptogen. Uh, they call it a mushroom of immortality in Chinese medicine. Um, it shows anti-obesity effects, it shows stress reduction, and it shows blood pressure and blood sugar regulation effects. So yeah, one of our local medicines that's growing on dead hemlock trees in abundance. So it's kind of the diamond in the rough um, with our local hemlock problems. And this is an interesting mushroom. Let's say I'm just walking around. If I were on a, a mushroom walk, I might just call it an LBM or little brown mushroom, a nondescript mushroom of no interest. And let's say I pick it. Um, well, I'll, I'll draw attention to the fact that it looks like it's in a cow patty. And the moment I touch this mushroom, I've committed a felony because this is a federally classified as a controlled substance. This is a psilocybin containing mushroom um, that a lot of people would call magic mushrooms. And it has a long history. I mean, actually not that long in the United States. It really became popular in like the 60s and 70s um, for recreational use of causing hallucinations temporarily for a couple hours. Um, and then and then more recently, I think it's getting a lot different reputation as uh, legitimate, non-frivolous, but therapeutic use for chronic depression, uh, term, people with terminal illnesses. Um, and there's a lot more evidence showing in, in, in traditional research settings that it, that it can be therapeutic when used that way. And I say it's, it's federally illegal here, but that's in this country. In other countries like Jamaica, um, it's totally legal. There are no laws on the books making it illegal. Um, and so people, people readily consume it, people readily cultivate it to no problem. And there's all these retreat centers popping up in Jamaica, Costa Rica, and other countries where it's totally illegal um, to use them therapeutically in that setting. Um, and then interestingly in the United States, you can order the spores of this mushroom and have them shipped to your door. And on that, on that um, um, syringe, it'll say for microscope use only, and you're looking at them, I don't know why, under a microscope. And the moment you feed it sugar water, you've committed a felony. And, and there are places like Denver and Oakland where it's totally illegal to possess them. So I, it's just kind of like, a, a, it's recently changing, but still a, a, a total felony in the United States. Um, but people would just still describe it as medicinal applications. Um, another application which you may not have thought of is that the idea that mushrooms can be used in environmental settings um, to prevent contamination. So if it's a contamination source, be it radioactive, be it petrochemical, be it a pesticide or herbicide that's persistent in an environment, mushrooms and the mycelium, which are basically miners, can break down compounds. So one example would be like petroleum, which is really just a bunch of hydrocarbon chains, can be broken down into smaller components. So in this case, if you put petroleum in a straw medium and then grow oyster mushrooms on it, the mushrooms are okay with that setting. Oyster is one of the most versatile, easy to please mushrooms. If you give it some carbon, it'll be okay. Um, and that's why a lot of people cultivate it on various medium. But in this case, 
it's accumulated any heavy metals in it. If let's say there was also like some lead or arsenic in here, it would accumulate it in the mushroom and then you would be able to harvest it and take it somewhere to, to, uh, to dispose of it in a better way than if it was just ambiently in the ground. So it, it's a way that they can extract it. Um, another application would be, um, well, this is kind of a scary application that morel mushrooms are love old apple orchards. But old apple orchards used to use a lot of lead arsenic, which is a, a pesticide, and it is persistent in the environment. And what mushrooms can do is they can chop down compounds. But what they can't do is change lead into something that's not lead or arsenic that's into something that's not arsenic. And so that lead and arsenic is still in that morel mushroom um, and you're consuming it. And so just something to be aware of in, in historical chem in, in places that historically use chemicals like lead arsenic. Um, and then a lot of cool research showing that this one soil borne fungus uh, found in the Amazon can break down plastics, albeit in a manner that's not as fast as we would like, but we're selecting for more uh, different strains that are better at breaking down the plastics. And in this case, if you put it with agar, which is a potato or seaweed based compound that people grow mushrooms on, it'll break down the plastics and make the entire thing edible. All not so tasty, but at least you can consume it. Just kind of, at least the novelty of, some, of eating something that ate plastics is pretty cool. And this is just showing some specific mushrooms, species, and the contaminants that they're specifically good at uh, breaking down. All right. And then some random applications that you might not have considered, um, mushroom leather. So like this hat, is mushroom leather um, and it was made in Romania. So this practice is still, is still being done. And these, these people in Romania will take the Amadou mushroom, which grows also in this temperate region, um, and they will carve it in a way and then tease it apart. And then it basically feels like suede and is quite durable, albeit a little bit flammable. So I keep smokers at a distance. Um, but this is, yeah, an interesting not, or like vegan source of leather that's, that's pretty cool. And we don't really think about wearing mushrooms. Um, this being uh, application for packaging materials. So it's like called mycofoam or a, mu a mushroom based foam product that can be used because mycelium basically fits whatever container you put it in. Like if you grow oyster mushrooms in like a jack-o-lantern, it's going to be the shape of that jack-o-lantern, which is pretty cool. And you could take advantage of that for packaging. Uh, and then something we mentioned earlier was cordyceps. So cordyceps, that insect eating genus of mushrooms. Um, in this case, what if we can use it to colonize fire ants and then and you find a cordyceps that loves fire ants then you load up your backpack sprayer and you go to town over acres of texan like texan landscape like other other states down in the south are totally plagued by fire ants and can we potentially use it as a like bio pesticide that is going to break down and really not cause that much harm now you may have some wariness about introducing another species when we've already gotten invasive species but you got to think a little differently with the invasives okay so that's kind of the application of get your brain churning for what um, fungi can do. Um, and now we're going to go a little bit more local of, of you in your environment or, or me in the case of a, a certified forager in the environment of kind of the do's and the don'ts um, and just kind of go out and about. So for some ethics and tips, um, number one, I made sure we're going to be 400% sure on your identification. Um, I've never poisoned myself or anyone else. I've never eaten anything I wasn't 100% or 400% positive on. Um, and there are some lookalikes. And so you should, you should go out in the woods with, with respect and hopefully confidence in what you're doing. Um, one thing is that you want to cut. You want to cut and you don't want to pluck. So what I've got a picture here and what I've got right here is an open L mushroom knife. Um, and this mushroom knife, the idea is that you cut the mushroom to not disturb the mycelium under the ground or in the wood. And then you brush off any dirt from, from, cause you don't want to bring that into your kitchen setting or anything. Um, and so you're cutting, not disturbing. Um, and you're not taking more than you need because we're picking the apple on the tree. I am not disturbing the ground underneath. I'm not like tromping through the woods, raking or clear cutting or anything. I'm just picking the apples. Um, and I'm taking what I feel like I need or can preserve. So when you find 10 pounds of chicken in the woods, maybe that's a lot more than you and your family and friends want to eat. But in the middle of winter, it's going to taste really good. And so one thing you can do is always cook and freeze the, the chicken of the woods or most mushrooms. And then some mushrooms like the shiitake, um, or in this case, the wine cap, what I've got down here, 
um, dehydrate very well. And so that's another way to preserve them if you're worried about it spoiling. Because that, that is the worst feeling is you pick a, a basket full of mushrooms and then they rot in your fridge. Um, okay. Where can you harvest? So as a citizen of the United States, you have a right to go into national forests around here and pick mushrooms. That land, it's, it's a, Nantahala is the man of many, land of many uses, and one of those uses is picking wild mushrooms. Um, and so you can get a permit like me um, from the health department to be able to sell them, but you have every right to pick them for personal consumption. Now, if you're picking hundreds of pounds, maybe they're going to start to get a little wary, but you have a right to go out there and pick them. Um, especially if you're being responsible, you don't, don't be afraid. And then private property, obviously if it's yours or you get consent of the owner, you can, you can pick to your heart's content. Um, but still you wanna be aware of any possible contaminants. If you're right next to a road um, or, or who knows what kind of um, chemical use is going on, just be something to be concerned about. Um, and then storage wise, paper bag in the fridge is always a good go-to. Um, unless you're talking about long-term, then you would maybe wanna cook and freeze. And then for your tummy, um, I have an iron gut and I've never gotten sick from mushrooms, but for some people, they might be more sensitive to new mushrooms. Um, and so when, when trying a new mushroom, you may want to start small um, and then always cook them. I would say in general, like I mentioned, the enzymes, we don't really have them to digest raw mushrooms, so better, best to always cook. Um, and I like coconut oil or butter. I always I tell most people, um, and maybe for the chanterelles, which are a little more delicate, maybe um, use some olive oil. Um, but start small and see how your tummy likes it. And it should not taste bitter. If you taste bitter, I would, I would question your identification. <laughs> all right. So it's not all good out there. Um, as I mentioned, there are mushrooms that are poisonous and some that are lethal. And in this case, all of these mushrooms are poisonous or lethal. Um, and this mushroom number three is the death cap. And it was responsible for 90% of mushroom fatalities in the world. Um, and this is, and, and we'll go over kind of, we don't have it around here, it's on the West Coast, but we have some other fungi that, um, that are that'll, that'll definitely out there and they will hurt you. Um, but I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to be respectful. So definitely after today, I want you to have respect when you go outside um, and not to be willy nilly, but also not to be afraid because this, this picture kind of demonstrates mycophobia or fear of mushrooms, which I believe the United States has passively inherited from England because England has a lot of fatal mushrooms and poisonous mushrooms and fewer edible gourmet mushrooms. And so let's know that going into the mushroom culture. And the United States is a relatively recent country. And so we can develop our own mushroom culture and also look to Eastern Europe and Asia, which have a lot longer traditions with these, with these fungi. So locally, these are the bad boys and girls. Um, the two on the left are poisonous and the two on the right are our only lethal mushrooms in the Southeast. It's good to know them by name. <laughs> um, you, you will and can see them anytime, anytime you want. Um, so we can just go kind of in order. So sickener with a name like that, I bet you can guess, it's gonna cause, it's the main thing is, is a, it's a vomit inducing mushroom. And so within two hours, you'll feel some gastric upset and vomit. And it's a red topped mushroom that's very brittle um, and white, white gills on the bottom, sickener. And squirrels will consume them and get a little intoxicated. But for us humans, it'll, it'll, it'll just make you a little sick. Um, and then we've got the jack-o'-lantern, which is often brought up as a look-alike for chanterelles. Although after today, hopefully you disagree and, you, and there's no way you would ever confuse them. Um, but they're an orange clustered mushroom growing on wood, as seen here. And another feature, which may or may not be helpful, uh, is they glow in the dark. And they do that to attract flies and moths in order to spread their spores. So that's jack lantern also going to cause yeah, gastric upset and vomiting. And then our lethal mushrooms. So this is a summer lethal mushroom called Destroying Angel. Now it's an amanita. And remember what I said about amanitas, they come out of little egg sacs in the ground, as you can see here. The Destroying Angel, not always, but most of the time has a little white skirt on it. Um, and is white spored mushroom. So an all white mushroom, so innocent. And yet, when you consume it, uh, with, you feel nothing for six hours, and then you start feeling a lot of bad symptoms, cramping, vomiting, diarrhea. And when you go to the hospital, one of the main things treatment wise is we're gonna give you a new liver because your liver is under attack and, and you will your liver will fail unless you get a new one. It's spooky stuff. And, there, and you can read some accounts of people who've survived it just barely.
working to try and get Joey back online. I've just sent him a text message. How about now? How about now? Are you How back? About now? Okay, good. Yeah. yeah, sorry, there was a power flicker here. <laughs> sorry uh, about that. Uh oh. Yeah, are we good now? Yeah, we're good. Okay. I, you were going to want to share your screen again, though. Yep. And does that work? Yes. Okay. Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> Living in the woods, things happen. <laughs> Are we all good? Okay. Um, I'm going to go backtrack a little bit. So yeah, Destroying Angel, we revere this mushroom. We respect it. We know it by its name. Um, and, and we know not to mess with any Amanitas, but especially this one, as one cap will kill an adult alongside Deadly Gallerina. Also, yeah, Rusty Brown, one cap will kill an adult. But this one is on wood. So the Amanita is on soil, and this mushroom is on wood. Just a good to know some of those features. So we've seen our enemy, or at least we respect our enemy, um, and we know that we'll never pick them to be eaten. Um, because we're looking for our friends in the woods, of which there are many. I have a license to sell 25 species, um, and, and they also teach you how to identify these species because you will see them when you're out and about, um, and you would never mistake them for food. You respect them. So the Highlands region is, is definitely known for chanterelles. Um, I know roads around here that I can drive and pick 15 pounds in an afternoon pretty reliably once or twice a week. Um, and we, it loves this area because we have so much pristine hardwood forest. And like I said, it's a, it's a soil borne mushroom that really likes yeah, hardwoods and takes at least 20 years to develop those relationships. Um, and it's a summer mushroom. I, I, I say that chanterelle season really starts um, in, in like June 21st. And another big feature of it is it has forking gills. So shallow forking gills that make like a Y shape. Uh, that's a characteristic of chanterelles. Um, and they're orange like this, to so like kind of egg yolk yellow like this. And then I include its cousin, which is black trumpet. Maybe some people would call it like the black chanterelle. It's a different uh, genus, but a close relative. And it really doesn't have any gills. It's more of just like smooth to like a little shallow wrinkles. Um, and this is like, a very earthy smelling, almost truffly gourmet mushroom. Um, one, one of my favorites, but I don't find it in huge abundance like the chanterelles. Um, so these chanterelles are going right out of the soil, unlike the jack-o'-lanterns. Just a contrast, like I said earlier, some people would call this a look-alike, but these are deeper gills clustered and on wood, whereas the chanterelles on soil um, and never clustered like this. This is as close density that I would really ever see them. Um, and so in order to pick like 15 pounds, I'm talking about many, many spots, um, as opposed to some of these other mushrooms, um, like chicken of the woods. So chicken of the woods, while, while you might only have to make 15 spots to get 15 pounds of chanterelles, one spot of chicken of the woods might yield 10 pounds, which is about what you're looking at right here. So one dead tree hosted 15 pounds, sorry, 10 pounds of chicken of the woods. Um, and so you'll find them just on a dead tree like this, almost always oaks. Um, hopefully not a pine. Um, and then they've got yellow pores on the bottom. We've got another species around here that has white pores on the bottom. Um, and and they're, they have a wider range than the chanterelles, where the chanterelles are really, the big months are June, July, August. The chicken of the woods you can find, yeah, late April all the way into at the end of October. It just kind of depends. Um, they're still coming out right now. Uh, and, and it's called chicken of the woods, as you might guess, because it really texture wise does resemble like shredded chicken. Um, and so just like a nice like, yeah, like, like uh, on sandwiches, stir fries, pizzas, um, all like, very tasty um, and just a yeah, nice, nice kind of mock meat of the woods. Um, and one of my favorites just because often you can find like big clusters of it. Um, I love chicken of the woods. This one, maybe, maybe most of you don't know of, and I include it kind of because it's so prolific and because most people don't know it. Um, and while you're picking your chanterelles, you're probably walking by loads of this mushroom, which are the milk caps, um, of which the main ones that we're talking about are fish cap, as shown here, and wrinkled milk cap, which is shown in the basket. Um, and so these are mushrooms that when you cut them, they will exude kind of like a white latex substance, um, hence the name milk cap. Um, and, and they have a smell to them, like the fish cap really is a quite strong fish smell. Um, the wrinkled milk cap, a little bit less of a smell. Um, and that'll like, the, the, the latex will like stain your hands a little bit, 
um, and your knife will get all kind of gooey. Um, and she may not care for it, but I include it just because it's so abundant. Um, it, and while you're looking for chanterelles, you might as well also be looking for, for fish caps and wrinkled milk caps. Um, and another weirdo is the blue milk cap. The indigo milk cap exudes a blue latex and is just as edible and tasty as these other milk caps. Um, and so if a mushroom makes milk, you know that it's in the lactiflus genus. Um, but in this, in this case on the right, you've got a mushroom that makes milk, is a milk cap, but it's spicy. So this is called Pex milk cap. And it's not poisonous, but it's unpalatable because when you, if that latex goes on your tongue, it makes your tongue tingle for like a couple minutes, which some people may enjoy. It's kind of like an interesting spice, nothing like capsaicin, um, but more of just like a physical sensation. Um, and just so you know, and the rings are, the, are, are a giveaway that it's Pex milk cap. So the concentric rings are absent on the good to eat ones, on the brown milk caps. Um, and there's white milk caps as well. And so none of, none of, the, none of the milk caps are going to hurt you in any way, but just some of them might be unpalatable and spicy. So, and you can just take a little bit of that latex and put it on your tongue and it'll be pretty noticeable in, in, in a matter of seconds. Um, all white, white spore prints and all soil borne fungi. So you'll, they're coming right out of the ground um, and, and you just cut them. And now when you cut them, you're, you're going to know they're a milk cap. Um, just good to know. But yeah, on the way, like uh, August is like one of the best months for these. Um, yes. And then I include this one because of seasonally. Uh, this is personally my, my favorite mushroom to eat. Uh, is the, in my opinion, the best tasting mushroom that grows around here. Uh, and, and is one that comes out when almost no mushrooms are out. So it's coming out now all the way into the end of October into November. Um, and it needs a little bit of cold. And it's called Hen of the Woods, the uh, Japanese name, Maitake. Um, and it's often at the base of trees. So it's a, I mean, I've only seen it either at the base of the tree or in the case of here on the right, who's this guy over here? But this oak tree had fallen over and this was at like the bottom of, of the base where it fell over. Um, and so it needs a little bit of cold, white spore print. It's a polypore mushroom. So like on, uh, you can see on the bottom, it's got like lots of little white pores. Um, and it's just one of the best tasting. It's hard, I mean, hard to describe taste, but um, I, I, we make a gravy out of it here for Thanksgiving pretty much every year. Um, and this was like one of my first introductory foraging mushrooms. I picked 10 pounds of it. I sold half of it for $100 and I made gravy out of the other half. And that's how I totally got hooked on this stuff. And so, I mean, they're, they're all over these woods um, at the base of oak trees. And it's questionable how parasitic they are on oaks. They may cause some internal rot. Um, but, and it's an evidence that if, if it's there, the tree is likely going to die somewhat soon. Um, so just good to know, but hen of the woods, one of my favorites. Um, yes. All right. Kind of a teaser. Um, uh, what is the largest organism in the world? Well, we're talking about mushrooms. So it's probably a mushroom, but it's kind of cheating, but it's not the blue whale at clocking in at a hundred feet. It's not Pondo, the Aspen Grove. That's about 110 acres. It's this 2,200 acre colony in Oregon of a honey mushroom species. Um, and so it's all one organism has a mycelial network that covers this vast area. And honey mushrooms are found all over temperate regions. And these are some pictures I took last week of honey mushrooms growing um, near the mountain. Uh, and so we've, we've got at the base of a hardwood, just a bunch of like brown looking mushrooms. Um, oftentimes they're, they're a little too old when I get to them, but I got lucky with these. They're very fibrous stalks, um, but they have a little bit of a sweet taste, hence the name honey, and they're a little brown color, kind of like honey. Um, and these mushrooms are white spored, and some people would say the deadly gallerina resembles it just because it's on wood and it's a brown mushroom. And I mentioned the rest of the rusty brown spore print of the gallerina. Well, in this case, this mushroom is white spored, and so how would I know it has white spores? So let's say I take this large cap right here and I move it aside, it probably, because it's a little older, has dropped spores on some of these lower mushrooms. And I would see the kind of markings of the white powder that was left from the top mushroom. So that's one way you can know. Or to be 100% sure, I would just cut off a cap, put it on tin foil, and wait a couple hours, and it will drop those spores. Even though it's not attached to the organism anymore, it still wants to make spores. Um, and I use tin foil to tell, uh, because if it's white spores, white paper is obviously not going to work. Um, and mushroom spores can be all sorts of colors. Uh, most of the good edible species are white spored. That's not a rule of thumb though, because um, all the amanitas are white spored. So that's not going to tell you that you mushrooms edible, but it's a useful point of identification, if that makes sense. And then we've got a lot of weirdos in these woods. 
Um, so we've got boletes, as I mentioned, they're kind of like stalked mushrooms with spongy bottoms. Um, and this is one of my favorites, it's called black velvet bolete. Um, Porcini is the most prized worldwide uh, as, of the boletes. It's like the king bolete, but this is like one of my favorite local boletes um, of which we have hundreds of species in these woods um, and almost all of which are edible. And the ones that are edible are not bitter. And so you can take a little bit in your mouth and just put it, and if it's not bitter, the bully is, is good to eat and you can saute it. But once again, spongy bottom. Uh, morels, we do get them around here, not in huge abundance. We're not as famous for them like the Midwest, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, um, but we do get them in some amounts, especially around old apple trees. Um, I've only found like six, so it's definitely not one of my, uh, one I have a lot of experience with, but they're so tasty. They're one of the best mushrooms for a reason. Um, this is one of my favorite groups of mushrooms called the stink horns. Um, they get their name because they smell putrid. Um, so in the case of the netted stink horn, this brown spore slime or the brown spore slime on the dog stink horn um, smells awful to attract flies to disperse its spores. Um, and the netted stink horn, oh my goodness, it's so beautiful. This, what you're looking at right here is like a skirt and it'll extend over the course of maybe two days and it'll make like a geodesic dome skirt around this mushroom. It's pretty cool, like beautiful, like the way it drops. Um, and they're, they're just pretty to look at, not for edible reasons. Um, and then locally, we've got cordyceps. So our cordyceps primarily mummify moth pupa. So there's the pupa of a moth that's underground, infected by the cordyceps, and then bloop, this orange mushroom bursts out of the soil, um, and you can see these little orange clubs sticking out, and you can excavate to find the moth pupa. And yeah, it's a very medicinal mushroom that grows around here. And then our hemlock reishi, um, I mentioned, yeah, very medicinal mushroom. Yeah, if you're seeing dead hemlock trees, um, you'll, you're more than likely gonna see some of these red varnish shelves um, that will get kind of darker red with age. Now they do have a famous edible part, this white tip when they're growing is very tasty to saute, but in general, this mushroom is made uh, into medicine. So people will dehydrate it and make an alcohol extract out of it, or just make a tea. I like putting it in a slow cooker and making broth out of the hemlock reishi. And then we got some more weirdos. We got the gelatinous stalked puffball. So it's a puffball that's like covered in this gooey substance that when it's older, you can squeeze it and spores will come shooting out. Um, and this is what m most puffballs look like. Um, puffballs are just kind of like these marshmallows. Um, and the rule about eating puffballs is these, especially right here, are very tasty, but they have to be all white when you cut into them. So it's just like a little marshmallow, um, but it has to be all white. Otherwise it's too old or it's a different species. So the good edible ones are all white in the middle. Um, earth stars, which resemble, yeah, kind of like an acorn flower hybrid, um, but pretty cool. And then coral mushrooms can take lots of shapes and sizes. This one in particular looks like a, like a hand candelabra, um, but kind of spooky. And they, and they can look, they can look pink, blue, purple, you name it. They're, they're, they're beautiful. And then lion's mane, um, a, a mushroom that resembles a pom-pom. They call it pom-pom mushroom. Uh, people say, describe its taste similar to like uh, crab meat, um, kind of looks like crab meat, uh, and a very medicinal mushroom as well. It's a very tasty mushroom that also shows uh, an ability to regenerate myelin sheaths in our neurons. So it has medicinal applications as well as being very tasty. And we can cultivate that in a clinical setting. All right, I guess I am, I'm, I'm finishing up this part uh, with some inspiration. So I'm including oyster mushrooms growing on cardboard as just kind of a cool way. Oysters, as I mentioned, are very versatile and easy to please. And so long as you're giving them paper, coffee grounds, or shredded paper, cardboard, it's gonna, it's gonna eat it right up and you can eat your waste, basically. Your, your paper and coffee waste can be put to use and you throw this right in your garden and the earthworms are gonna love it. So I think oyster mushrooms are a great way to include mushrooms as part of like your just general home life uh, as kind of your uh, home, home recycling unit. Um, and then I include this lion main picture again, just to kind of demonstrate that I took this picture when I knew nothing about mushrooms. Um, I took this picture because it was beautiful. I mean, it was several feet wide and I was like, holy cow, I've never seen anything like this. Went back home and then found out it was edible. Little did I know, and if I saw that today, I would say, wow, that's like a $200 mushroom. That's at least 10 pounds of lion's mane that I could sell at the farmer's market. And so it just kind of takes time with naturalism in general to kind of develop the confidence um, and, and, you, and you're going to walk in the same environments again and again and notice new friends out there. So as you, as you identify more fungi, you're going to end up um, experiencing a greater appreciation of what you're walking by every day. 
I think it's kind of cool to think about all the fungi you've walked by and never noticed. Um, little didn't know you, some of them were very tasty and it could have been in your skillet that night. And then last one I'll include is this is also from Paul Stamets, uh, Growing Gourmet Medicinals. Um, this is just kind of like the infinite potential of mushrooms. So a button mushroom like this using the spores can be grown on a Petri dish, inoculate a grain jar, and that one grain jar could inoculate 10 grain jars, and those 10 grain jars could inoculate 10 grain jars, and those 10 grain jars could inoculate 10 grain jars. And then you fruit all those mushrooms on sawdust bags, and you can make, in theory, a million pounds of mushrooms in 80 days. And I just think that is like one of the coolest demonstrations of the fact that mushrooms are amazing at when they want to live really badly. And the question is, can humans partner with them to hopefully make the world a better place? And I believe the answer definitely to be yes, um, that mushrooms can, can help feed us, can help provide us a little bit of uh, medicine in addition to having other applications like food packaging, et cetera. Um, and so the infinite potential of mushrooms uh, has yet to be discovered. And I think we can, we can make a, a better world with, with them as partners. Um, yeah, go team. Hopefully that was not too over. Uh, no, I think I've seen lots of really positive comments about how much people are really enjoying it and, um, and so informative and so much information. I, I did have one question early on that asked for a little clarification on, the distinct, on distinguishing between a truffle and a mushroom thinking that the truffle was its own class. Can you clarify um, the distinction between the two? They're a fungus and they're, they have a fruiting body, but it's underground. Um, it's like a tuber. Uh, and so I've heard evolutionarily, they were above ground making mushrooms and then they, they went, they receded back into the ground. So they definitely know something that we don't know. They're preparing or something. Um, but they have a relationship with tree roots um, and form little nodules um, that in, they're called sclerotia and you cut them open and it would, and it's like a marbled appearance. Um, and that, and, and that's, I, actually, I should say that people do eat truffles raw. So it's, it is one of the few mushrooms that people do like grate it just over pasta. Um, and, 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 and it's a different texture than, than any other mushroom you're likely to encounter. Um, so yeah, they're quite different than any of the above ground, uh, basidiomycetes that we talked about today. Great. Thank you for that clarification. And I know I mentioned early on, and people may have missed it, I will be sending a, I've been recording this yep. presentation, we'll be sending the link to the recording, but also a list of resources um, yeah. that have pre-provided me um, so that you, you can use to double, triple check in identification and, um, and yep. also information about um, mountain uh, retreat and learning centers so that you can so folks can know a little bit more about what you do. One question that has come up is that um, someone heard a tale that if you see an insect on a mushroom that it's safe to eat, is that true? <laughs> There's, I, I've, I've heard that, I've heard, uh, I've heard some weird ones about throwing, throwing coins in a, in a bucket that has the mushroom in it. Um, I mean, you are more than welcome to, to th see that as, as, as folk uh, like kind of like a, a folk way to, to identify, but I would, I would definitely not trust that. I, I've definitely seen, um, in, I mean, for example, I mean, you, you see insects all over these stink horns on this page uh, and they're, they're not good. To eat. You're not going to enjoy eating them. I know that for sure. They're not going to hurt you, but um, I, I don't think that's a good rule of thumb. I think uh, I've heard one thing I've heard before is guild mushrooms are, are, are the ones that are poisonous. So if you stay away from a guild mushroom, you're not going to die. So like none of, none of the shelf or poor mushrooms are going to kill you in this region. So that's like one of the only rules of thumb is all, all the bad mushrooms have gills. Um, and yeah, I guess, yeah, a couple things. One, yeah, Mushrooms of the Carolinas is a book by the Bassettes. And it is, my, in my opinion, the best local guide. Um, it's not going to overwhelm you with California, pictures of California mushrooms that you're never going to see out here. Um, and and they're, they're, the Bassettes teach at the bio station um, every, every once in a while. So, I mean, they're, they're local resources. I mean, yeah, this area is very unique for them. Um, and I guess really quickly, you mentioned the Mountain Retreat and Learning Center. Just, uh, yeah, I mean, it's an amazing place. Uh, I basically have 100 acres of playground that's loaded with fungal diversity. And I was like, my first day here, I photographed like 40 species. Um, and that's really what got me going is, is just walking around in these woods. That's very cool. Somebody wants to know, can you harvest the entire chicken of the wood or should you leave some behind? I, so, 
uh, where's I was going to go to where's the other chicken in the woods picture like so a common thing that you'll encounter is like a picture like this um well first of all at, towards the edge is going to be woodier um and i should have mentioned this like when you harvest especially chicken in the woods let's say i cut this i definitely want to look at the back end of it and look to see if it has maggots like because old chicken of the woods is known to have uh, maggots in it and then it's up to you like your quality and your standards are do you want to eat it and saute it um, but in general, I would leave some of the woodier bits as that's really where the mycelium is. And it's not going to taste as good anyways. The tenderness, the tender tips are like, what's, where's the good stuff anyways. Um, but in general, especially if, um, if it's a huge quantity like this, I would, I would leave some to sporulate. Um, but as long as you're leaving like an inch of, of the, of the chunky mycelium on it, I think you're, you're fine taking, taking any of it. It's di completely different ethics than plants. When you harvest ginseng, you're, you're taking the roots out. That plant is done. Whereas with, in the case of chicken of the woods, it's still in this tree. That mycelium is vast and it's likely to come back until that tree is practically soil. Um, so there's, there should not be guilt involved. Uh, yeah, as long as you're using a knife, don't yank, cut it. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that's really good information because it's a key part of, you know, Village Nature Series is, is wanting to make sure that we're, you know, as to your earlier points that we're, you know, ethically and, and carefully conserving um, our natural resources, so. Definitely, yeah, I personally view like foraging is one of the coolest like, yeah, convergences of so many things, but it's definitely a reason to preserve these forests. Like I'm, I am invested in these woods to be, to be here in perpetuity because I want the hardwoods to be here. Um, I'm, I'm not looking for a quick buck. I'm not looking to, to just eat something and degrade the landscape. I want these woods to be intact. Um, and then socioeconomically, I mean, there's, I mean, a lot of people across the world are able to make a living off of sustainable foraging. Um, and so there's just, a, and then, and then like paying homage to the Cherokee and other indigenous groups that have been eating honey mushrooms and Sochan for a long time, a lot longer than we've been here. Um, so it's just like a cool convergence of a lot of things. And it's just a great way to experience hiking. It's basically hiking while playing an identification game that you can sometimes throw in your skillet. All right, yeah. and just, to, just to, um, to emphasize the point you made earlier, you do recommend cutting all and not plucking um, yes. mushrooms. So, and you know, this, yep. this is really nice. I'm gonna give a couple more minutes for people to post questions in the chat feature, but it occurs to me that this is just really full circle. We started the Village Nature Series 2020 um, with an emphasis on Earth Day. We had to completely adjust and modify. And so we ended up um, get it, having an ethnobotanist from Western Carolina who actually does um, for, uh, actually forage gardens and so actually preserves the land around his property so that you know he's actually actively preserving and and producing for foraged food from the garden and then we also we had isla hatter last month in honor of the centennial of the women's um passage of the 19th amendment because she's our woman naturalist treasure and you know and she foraging is you know is her life her medicine can't cabinet and her pantry and so appropriate to end with um with how mushrooms can change the world and the importance <laughs> of foraging i'm gonna ask you uh, if you didn't because i haven't had a chance to really look at the e at the email um if you in that resource email could provide me um a source for getting a, a knife one of the mushroom knives like you have with a brush uh, Openel, I did, I did not include it, but Openel is a French knife company that's just very nice. Um, I mean, Amazon's got lots of options, but this is like a, one of the best reliable ones. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, Openel is where it's at. And these are boar bristles. So it's, it's coarse and it can get that heavy dirt off of your shot. I mean, so some mushrooms are just notorious for being dirty. Um, chanterelles are coming right out of the ground. And so they deserve a quick brush. Black trumpets often coming out in sandy locations. So having a brush is, does come in handy, um, definitely. But yeah, seriously, y'all, when you're out and about right now, hen of the woods, keep your eyes out. Um, as it starts to get a little colder, um, it will make your Thanksgiving 10 times better. Um, it is amazing. And, and, it's, and, so, and it's one of those mushrooms that checks a lot of the medicinal boxes along with being one of the tastiest. So this book, Fungal Pharmacy, kind of breaks down mushrooms. I mean, it checks so many boxes and it's one of the best tasting. So really can't emphasize that enough. Keep your eyes peeled for hen of the woods this fall.
And I'm going to um, I'm going to pick on you a little bit because I've seen you do it on Wednesday afternoons at our market, and people get excited and they've been foraging in the woods and they have <laughs> something that they've harvested that they do bring it to you so that they can confirm oh, yeah. that that's what it is with you. And so yep. I know you're very you're very gracious and generous with people to, mm -hmm. to share your knowledge and to confirm you know what it is that they've. Sure. Done that yeah. Because I, I work on an educational farm. I'm there at the farmer's market to sell my wares, but I'm also there to, yeah, to, to teach people. And I mean, I was in your position like four years ago of knowing I'd, I'd grown a little bit of oyster mushrooms, but apart from that, didn't know much about wild mushrooms. Um, and it's just, yeah, I understand what it's like to, to appreciate the mushrooms, but not know what you're looking at. Um, so when you're out and about and you see a uh, giant hemlock reishi or, or anything else, yeah, definitely feel free to text me pictures, email me pictures, um, because yeah, these, lo these woods are loaded. Um, and, and you don't need to know everything. You can use uh, community resources by all means. And, you know, and I know you also uh, offer great cooking tips and, and, and cleaning tips and, and washing how to wash and how, you know, to prepare and prep, prep what, you, <laughs> what you've got. So yeah, I live with a, I live with a chef and, and he's, and he does a good job. Uh, yeah, he can, he can, yeah, he's the one who taught me how to like cook uh, hen of the woods and like, yeah, he was serving at the ugly dog at the time. Uh, they did like a little like uh, battered and fried like tempura hen of the woods is really good. I'm getting hungry now. I um, I'll tell you something <laughs> else that I that I learned that I'm also in addition to keeping my eye out for um, for all different kinds of fun fungi in the in the woods around me. I'm going to also keep my eyes out for drunken squirrels. There you go. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, I mean squirrels, uh, squirrels, deer, bear, and and snails love to eat mushrooms just like we do. So but they don't know about cooking them. As soon as they find that out, we're, we're going to be competing. <laughs> yeah. well, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this out and just say thank you so much, Joey. This has been so informative and, and, and interesting. And, um, and I know that it's been very um, well received. And we will um, actually be, as I mentioned earlier at the top of the program, we're recording this program. And so once the video is processed, those of you who registered um, via email, you will get a personal email with a link to the recording so you can go back and review the presentation. It'll also have a set of resources for, uh, that Joey's recommended to, for you to reference. It'll have um, information about how to contact Joey and also uh, about the Mountain um, Retreat and Learning Center so that you can, you can get to know a little bit about, more about that amazing property where he is. And um, this is the final Village Nature Series um, for 2020. Um, probably in the next month or so, we'll be sending, a, that's the great thing about the, this, you know, capturing all these new emails is those of you who have participated in the program, and if you would be so kind, we'll probably be sending a short survey out to you so that we can know what topics are of interest to you and how we can improve upon this. Likely, we're already looking at probably um, definitely moving forward with the virtual presentations. Hopefully, we'll be able to accommodate uh, a gathered group again, and but we'll still, um, we've learned from this experience that we will offer this as a hybrid program so that those who are, you know, might have a local presence here, but might, might not physically be present here can still participate. And I just want to say a final word of thanks to my colleagues at the Highlands Cashers Land Trust. This is a team effort and we work very closely together. They're a pleasure to work with. They do great work um, by preserving the special places that, um, that we love and cherish up here. Um, and so I enjoy working with them and want to say a special thanks to them and also to our friends at Cedar Creek Club who financially support, support this educational program that we're able to offer you. I hope that you will continue to stay well, be well, uh, and visit the Village Green um, and, and use us for, for all kinds of safely distanced opportunities. Um, nature never fails you is what we're saying this um, this season and certainly I know that the folks at the land trust would would concur with the places that they preserve and their mission is is so similar in that vein so um, y'all be well and we'll be back with you again for another great season of village nature series in 2021 have a nice evening thanks Anne thanks Gary yeah